Welcome to this edition of Journals of Spiritual Discovery, brought to you by spiritualteachers.org. I'm your host, Sean Nevins. Hello and welcome to this month's edition of Journals of Spiritual Discovery. My guest is Bob Ferguson. He's the author of The Listening Attention and Dark Zen, A Guru on the Bayou. He's also been featured on a Conscious TV interview. And I did a documentary about Bob back in 2014. It's called Mountain High. This interview was a nice chance for me to catch up with Bob and see what's happened in the years since we did our last interview. And we really delve into especially his idea about the repressed emotional material that can drain our energy and can interfere with what he calls developing the listening attention. We also talk a bit about a new chapter in Bob's life, which is that he's going to be the teacher in residence at Tat's new center near Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And like last episode, I'm asking once again if all of you listeners would please consider making a donation to Tat's new center. Uh, we'll be having our April meeting there. And if you went to tatfoundation.org, go to the About page, and then you'll see in the drop-down menu the Homing Ground. And there's a donation button on that page. Please consider donating a, a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, whatever works for you. Uh, a lot of people making small donations will go a long way towards finishing these projects that we have to get the center ready for the April meeting. For example, we need to put in a parking area for all the vehicles that will be showing up, and there's some work that needs to be done to the water system as well before the April meeting. So please consider doing that. I would really appreciate it, and I hope you enjoy this interview with Bob Ferguson. Well, uh, Bob, thanks for agreeing to do this interview. I, I really appreciate it. It's been a it's actually been a few years since we've had a chance to sit down and talk, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. It's, it has been quite a while. I know I've been enjoying listening to your podcast on the ones you've been doing. Good. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, I did want to... I wanted to go back... Uh, well, a couple of things I guess I'll say before we before we jump in. One, uh, if people want to know uh, more about uh, your story and so forth, I would I would point them to your book, The Listening Attention, as well as the documentary that we did some years ago, Mountain High, which really goes into a lot of your backstory. Um, that said, I did want to uh, ask a question about the listening attention because I really feel like that is, it's a book that if people don't consider it a classic, it should be considered a classic. Um, it's a short book that's an easy read in a way, yet is has got a lot to it. And... Uh, and there's a quote from there that I wanted to launch this interview with. And you said uh, early in the book, you made the point that uh, we, much, we must reach a point where we can slip behind our compensatory thinking patterns long enough to let something real get through. All repressed emotional material and debilitating drains in our energy must be dealt with too and uh, and I really keyed in with the all repressed emotional material and debilitating drains because that's something that I've been thinking about a lot over the past few years and I was just curious since you've written that if you if you had any more thoughts about that line or if you had any more or if that was something that you ran into a lot with people as you were uh, helping them or working with people uh, that repressed emotional material and those drains on the energy yes it, it's something that, that 
comes up for myself uh, in phases. You know, it'll pop up and it, it'll start up uh, noticing it because I'll try to do something in the world. And these things will come up according to the circumstances. And I've noticed the same thing happening to other people in groups. <clears throat> that as soon as a certain circumstance keys into their emotional center, that it brings up a, a pattern, a negative pattern. And this negative pattern does that. It, it shuts down what you might call the uh, access to the intuition. And sometimes I see that intuition is maybe the way that the inner self talks to the ego mind. And if that gets shut down, then you end up in pretty much in the robot. And then the negative emotional states just take over. You know, it, it's funny how this can work. I, in a relationship I was in a few years ago, this popped up again because the relationship was very similar to what I had gone through with my parents. It was like their relationship. And this stuff was hidden down in there and didn't come up until it was triggered by outside circumstances. And then it was just amazing. I was like, where did all this come from? I thought this was all gone, but once it was triggered, it popped back up again. And it made a mess out of stuff. So it, it's, it's like the opposite of, uh, of being independent. It, it puts us into a stage where we have no, uh, no leeway in our thinking. We can just turn back into robot mode. Well, when you say intuition... Uh, and inner self are you do you distinguish between those two things or what's your terminology your definitions yeah the, I would just say that the inner self is like the the manifesting form of our essential being or of uh, what is our uh, true discernment our true intelligence rather than the artificial intelligence of uh, the experiencer that comes from the world. And the intuition is, is how this inner self, this real part of us, how it communicates to us. And by, and by inner self, I don't mean some uh, void or, or uh, all-encompassing thing that doesn't have a, an ability to communicate in a differentiated manner. I'm talking about something that's... Uh, that from the ego's point of view, it's something that's trying to help us. And the way that it gets through to us is the intuition. That's the, the communication. And in these things, are, that communication is a natural thing. I think we had it when we were kids because we weren't uh, clouded up with emotional experiences, with things that had happened to us that, that shocked the central nervous system so bad that it formed a defense pattern. In other words, we, when we were little, we were clear enough to allow this uh, communication between the real part of ourselves and the part of ourselves that has to act in the world. If we can keep that channel open, then uh, things can work much better. It, it, it leads us... Uh, into what you might call our potential rather than being just a, uh, a billiard ball that's bouncing around off the effects of all the other balls. And then the ego, when you say ego and you say robot, are those are those different in, in some way? Can you explain that a little bit? Not they're, I don't think they're different in a practical sense. I mean, uh, ego is one of those weak words that's been watered down so much. And But in, in this instance, I think it would be that it's, it's the associative uh, part of ourselves that's built from experience so that it has no real intelligence. It, it just has to uh, rely on built-up past experiences and how those go together. So that each person's is very different, but since we're in the same world, we can get along. But it is robotic because it has no 
higher power from which to draw. It, it can only come from his experience, so it, it's very limited. So that, that's what makes it like a robot. Now the, the true intelligence, the, the inner self or the higher power, has a strange form of an intelligence uh, that's sort of along the lines of true discernment. It, it knows and can think intelligently, but it's always in the moment. It, it doesn't get trapped through experience or by emotions. It's always free to, uh, to be in the moment. It doesn't get stuck up in uh, those uh, past emotional traumas we were talking about. And in, and in this, in your frame framework, could the ego be guided by the inner self or intuition? Or, or are they just kind of, the ego is always going to be robotic? <laughs> in and of itself, yes, it, it, it's going to be robotic. But it can be guided by that in terms of uh, the inner self, uh, keeping it from, doing uh, from the ego from doing what it wants to do in and of itself. It adds a whole different dimension. This is like the, the difference between the being completely self-centered and finally realizing that there's something, that there's an ability we have to act for something other than our self-interest. It adds a whole nother dimension. I think uh, as oh, somebody, maybe it was... Uh, Poyan said that you can think of the ego as being the manager, but it has to understand that it's not the owner. It simply is, is a function that helps us to get by in a complicated world, but it isn't where we take our, uh, our meaning from. And then the, the listening attention, which I just kind of blew, I just dropped that phrase and I that didn't really come back to it. The listening attention is a, would you call it a way or a method of reaching the inner self? Yes, it, it, it's, it's the ability to, to look instead of uh, thinking or feeling and, or reacting. It, it's a funny thing. I think uh, Art Tickner once said that that getting serious to him was finally having the ability to look. And that, that's pretty much the listening attention. One has to, to get away from reacting and thinking and feeling and actually be free enough from the emotional traumas or the necessities of the day to actually just listen, as, as, as you could say, or look. Either one, it's the same thing. It's turning the attention to the point where it's, it's receiving rather than trying to always move out of the moment in thought and feeling. It, it requires us to be very uh, still and not have anything bugging us, so to speak. And then if we take this, this attention, which is free of the mind associations, and try to, to focus it inside of ourselves, <clears throat> then we'll if, if we have that willingness and we have a sort of a, oh, I don't know, a nostalgic feel that there's something better if we could only tie into it, then we may be able to open that line of communication. Of course, a, a funny thing might happen if you do this enough, then th there could be a switch in viewpoints so that the, the personal viewpoint is no longer in that reactive mind, but is in the listening attention. If I, if I said to myself, all right, that, that sounds kind of cool. I want to give this a try. I'm going to, I'm going to sit here and uh, practice the, the listening attention. Um, I mean, can you, can you flesh out a little bit like, you know, thoughts are going to come up. So I, you know, and then, uh, you know, memories may come up or I may think like, I don't know what I'm doing or what, what are, what are some clues about beginning that listening attention? Well, one, one thing you'll notice first is that, you know, thoughts and emotions just happen on their own and 
the, you can't just make a heroic effort to make them all go away. It, there, there's got to be a, a sort of a system to it. One of the things is what Rose pointed out is that you can not think along lines that are not useful. In other words, we can keep try to keep our attention at least turned along the lines of uh, spiritual work and of the listening attention and not allow it to wander off into trivia. And another thing is, is that you've got to notice what comes up and what is bothering you. One of the strangest things about this is when I first started trying to practice meditation and started to notice these things was that uh, if I got quiet and tried to listening attention, what would happen would be that emotional traumas would come up instead of quiet. So by trial and error, I realized that I had to take care of the emotional traumas to get the energy out of them. They're like knots of energy or cramps. And to get that emotional energy out of them, to not identify with them, to take them personally, then they would go away and I would be a little bit freer. And then I would have a little more ability to actually sit in the quiet so that there, there wouldn't be things that would all of a sudden pop up and hit the emotional center that were being repressed. And the funny thing is, if you do get quiet in the listening attention, then those knots, can, if you've got the, the right vector, those knots will start to present themselves. And it may seem horrible. It's, it's like one of the sayings that the truth will set you free, but at first it's, uh, it's agony. It, the, the light coming through hurts at first because you've got a lot of junk. But eventually, if you keep facing it and clearing it out, you'll notice that it gets smaller and smaller. And the times that you're clear and can kind of pick up on the right silent wavelength, those times will increase. So it, definitely those emotional traumas or repressed knots back there we were talking about, those, those have to be dealt with. Given that, in my opinion, uh, a lot of people get into the spiritual search because of trauma or one form or another, and they're looking for some relief from that, and... and I I think the, uh, a lot of a lot of spiritual practice or some spiritual practice doesn't really in any way address or have a way to uh, how how did you phrase it take the energy out of those knots um, do you do you have a specific advice for people? Is it unique to each person? I mean, what do, what do I do? For example, if I sit down, and uh, the thing that just keeps coming up is the ways that people have screwed me over day in and day out is what keeps coming up. I mean, what do I what do I do? How do I deal with that? Yeah, that's that's a good point. I, I've seen this in groups over and over again where people will come in and if they're in a sort of a safe position and they think they're around people that aren't going to attack them, <clears throat> then these things will pop out. It, it's almost amazing how quick <clears throat> the resentments and the jealousies and things will pop out and they'll start, start talking about them and <clears throat> trying to get some sort of release from them. I, I think there, there's got to be a, a, a way of realizing that, that we're not the, the center of the universe and there has to be some sort of intuition that comes through that helps us see that we need help. Just knowing that we need help and that in and of ourselves we come to the point where we can't fix ourselves. It, it's a certain strange form of surrender that we have to know that we need this help. Because if whatever we've tried to do doesn't work. I, I think until we come to that realization that in and of uh, ourselves as an ego, that we can't uh, somehow or another f fix ourselves through mental gyrations, that 
we're not going to be able to, able to listen and get any objectivity going. Do you think that, uh, I mean, I recall a line in, in Richard Rose's meditation pamphlet uh, where he was laying out meditation and he, and he starts with something like uh, reviewing past uh, traumas to the self or something along those lines. Uh, do you think that, I mean, my, uh, just speaking for myself, uh, seeing those things as objective as I could review them, sometimes I was able to think, you know, that actually wasn't such a big deal because now I can see in retrospect that this person who I hated so much, they were actually just doing the best that they could and they didn't really have any bad intention towards me, et cetera, et cetera. And that kind of took the juice out of whatever imagined affront there was. Oh, definitely. I, I think it, well, the one, the one thing I've seen we can do is, is watch other people and when they become very irritating or there's something puzzling about them, <laughs> this is almost always because we're seeing ourselves and, and the ego just can't admit it. So it, it says it's the other person. You know, it, it, it still happens to me. I'll find somebody's very irritating and just it driving me up the wall. And if I can look at them close enough and say, what, what, why is this? It, it's all out of proportion to what it should be. It's irrational. And it it's always comes down to the point that there's something in me that I refuse to admit and I can see it in them. And then once you can do that, then you can go, like you just said, it's like, well, wow, they're going through the same thing I'm going through and neither one of us seems to be able to get a handle on it, <clears throat> so it takes the the charge out of it. It's it's not personal anymore, and then for some reason that that, that diffuses it. Yeah, I think I think some uh, some traumas, some emotional material that that works, but I uh, but I think that there are some other things that. We get stuck in cycles of reaction patterns that we just can't. We can't think our way out of. We can't analyze our way out of. So, do you have any? Um, do you have any personal experience with that sort of thing, or people you've worked with that maybe you could share of other ways of processing that sort of material? Well, I think one of the the, the most important things that, that can happen to us, which is uh, the Gurdjieffians call it first conscious shock. And to me, it's what happens is, is all of a sudden you see that there is another way to take things from the usual pattern that you have. That we're, we're stuck in a pattern where, we're, like we're saying, we're robots and everything happens in a set way. But if you see all of a sudden that you can actually take an event in more than one way and don't have to always see it as being the same, that, that's incredibly freeing. It, it comes as a horrible shock because it knocks a, a foundation out from under us in a way. I, I think it's like seeing your state of mind. <clears throat> like I, I've noticed that, uh, well, for, for instance, when I went off to college, I came out of a, the same state of mind I was in my family and saw other ones. I saw that there were other people who were different from me in ways that they thought and ways they believed and what they thought life was all about. And it was such a shock. I, I, it was like, how can, you know, I have been stuck in this same way of thinking for so long and, and the world is a bigger place. It was also like when I moved from Louisiana to Colorado the first time. It was like a friend of mine said when he did something similar, he said it was like the sun came out. It was like there was a whole different way of looking at things. And this this is a, make a huge shock to the system emotionally. And we realize that, oh my God, I am a robot. And there is an infinite way of looking at everything that 
for some reason, my emotional center is stuck in it. But it can be free from that. And, and, and I'm, I'm assuming that the first part of that is that, well, number one, I have to be able to see that there is a pattern. I at least have to have enough awareness that, oh, you know, I have been grinding over this thing that happened to me in one form or another for the past 15 years. You know, there's a one thing I think that I've noticed it in myself and in others. I've noticed how it, it stops people in groups who I, I've seen where they get stuck in a position for years. And the key to it seems to be that they have never developed a practical ego system. In other words, they've never learned how to do. They've never learned a skill. They've never been able to stick something out long enough to be able to, to face hardships without it affecting them adversely. They've never been able to, to uh, walk a straight line or actually be able to uh, accomplish something. And what they can do is they'll see spiritual work as an escape. And they'll start doing spiritual work, but they can't make any headway in it. They'll keep looking at it, but they're always turned back around in a circle, or they keep getting into uh, depressions or beatdowns and don't have any kind of uh, <clears throat> ability to pull themselves up because they've never learned how to do, and their practical ego system is bound up in their head and imagination. So I seem that just being able to somehow or another <clears throat> see that there's nothing uh, good about hiding from the world and to try to get yourself in a position where you have skills and you can accomplish things then all of a sudden spiritual work can really take off it seems like it it seems like it takes a, a shock that for some reason I don't think we can uh plan or carry that out we can't really shock ourselves the only thing we can do is sort of make the commitment that I, I want things to get better I want to know why I'm doing what I'm doing and why is this a mess not not to blame other people and then make that commitment to yourself to say Let, let's find out what's going to happen I'll do whatever it takes and then something inside of us can set things up so that the proper shocks will come and, and knock a hole in our head so that something can get in. But we got to take chances. You, you, we can't let the ego over plan everything so that we never make a move. Yeah, it sounds like you're, you said uh, something inside of us sets things up or something along those lines. It sounds like you're, you're pointing to uh, if we have the intention or if we have the willingness, um, maybe uh, circumstances arise in our favor. Yes, exactly. If we, it's it's that quote by Murray who who made the quote about commitment when he was on the uh, Himalayan expedition. That, that's such a wonderful thing, and it applies to everything. Anytime you make a commitment and you realize that you've got to, to do it regardless of the resistance or the fears or the distractions, and you also realize that in and of yourself, you can't do it without help, then I'm, I'm convinced that there's something inside of us. It's hard to say what, you know, it's, it's, you could call it the inner self, you could call it God, you can call it a angels or whatever, but something will start helping you. And the thing about it is, it may help you in ways that would be exactly uh, opposite of what your your ego desire is. So that that's what, what's tricky about it, is it, if it decides that you need a shock, it's good that it's not communicating this in a certain way, because otherwise you would uh, second-guess yourself out of it. And the shocks have to come as uh, uh, spontaneously. 
so they have the effect. So we, we can't sort of try to uh, play chess with ourselves. It, it's got to be something more direct. Uh, you've you've been working uh, formally, informally with people over the, the past number of years, and uh, I know you've had some small groups in the Denver area that have met. Uh, what do you what do you see as your role in a person's spiritual path as a you know, you as a, a teacher or a friend, however you want to phrase that, what, 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 how, how could people benefit from, from working with you or just how do you see that whole teacher student thing? You know, that, that's a good one because, uh, you know, if working with these groups for, for years, uh, you know, I think I've made every mistake possible <laughs> I've gone along, gone along with it, and and over the long period, you you see that the the thing that seems to be most effective is uh, is somehow uh, through your own uh, presence and uh, just uh, being there, you can you can help people by giving them a hope, and and the hope is that the spiritual work is real and it can be done that it, it's it it keeps them from lapsing back off into oh there's nothing here to do let's just go back to life you know that here you can show them that well yeah there is somebody who's been able to to get out of messes and find something <clears throat> even though that something isn't you know riches or fame it, it's something that the intuition says you might could get, and here it is. I, it, it's uh, it it's almost like it enables them to articulate what they've been feeling. They they can look at you as a teacher and a friend and say, "Well, this guy can do it. He did it, and he has a way of talking about it, so it's real." And that means I can do it. Now, I think that's the best way, you know, in, any other way is uh, is personal with people and you've got to get to know them. And then you can maybe work with them on things that you can understand about them. But mostly though, from what I got from teachers was it's the same thing I hope that I can pass on. And that's just the, the possibility that there is hope, there is something to shoot for and that it, it's sort of like a... Uh, central nervous system of one to another it, it's not it's not as much words as just a, a feeling presence and is that uh, how does that relate to uh, a person discovering or connecting to their inner self is that is that what's going on when a person uh, it's a feeling for this is real. Like, is that their inner self speaking? It, it's exactly it. it. It's 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 like the old saying, you know, you find the guru outside yourself first. Then you find the inner guru. If a person can find that there is something to shoot for from a teacher or a friend, and he gets this from, from the, the friendship of the other person and from talking and relating to them so that they can understand more about what this is about. And somehow or another, that leads them to find the same thing in themselves. I mean, that, that's what happened to me. I, I felt that if I could just find the right teacher, you know, at the time I didn't have the words like this, but I knew that if I could find a, a person who had the right feel or presence to them, then something in me would uh, would come alive and be reconnected. I would rediscover it. I had forgotten what it felt like or where it was. And that's exactly what happened. I had found uh, Richard Rose for, for a long time ago, and that keyed it in. And something in me just went, yes, that's it. This is what you've been looking for. And eventually, I realized that I would have been looking for the same thing in myself. But 
we're built in such a funny way and we're so out of directed that we think it's something that's lacking outside of ourselves. We, we just can't turn around and find it anymore. We've lost it. And another person can help get that process back on track. And eventually, that's what needs to happen. Eventually, the 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 student has to uh, become interdirected too, and then he no longer needs a teacher as such. And the, the the finding of that or the connection to that inner self is that. Would you call that enlightenment? Is enlightenment uh, something else? I, I think it's something else. I think that that connection there is like your first important step within. It, it's the realizing that there's something higher, there's something greater. It, it'll usually coincides with all of a sudden realizing that uh, that other people are real and just as real as you, and that what's in them is the same thing that's in you. That we're all one, so to speak. This is a a connection to something higher. It it's not enlightenment because enlightenment is the when the uh, personal self is, is seen for what it is because you have become connected with that inner self. The viewpoint changes. It, it's not a an experience or a connection. It's a change of uh, identity. So then the the problem kind of sw- or or the, the viewpoint switches. It's what was looking for within is now without, and what was within is now the the viewpoint. Yeah, I think that was, that's really, uh, I hope people pick up on that. That's a really packed <laughs> statement that you just made. Like, there's a lot there, and, and uh, yeah, people should just sit with that and see what comes up it, it, it's a funny thing because it, it's something you, you you can't imagine it it's you know the imagination doesn't help it's it's uh it's very hard to describe i i you know uh one thing that's uh i've noticed that's very uh helpful is being able to for people to to not be afraid in an irrational manner. And I've seen this stop people so many times. If they allow an irrational sort of outside fear to get a hold of them so that they're afraid of losing their identity, <clears throat> and it's, it's like they're, they're afraid to step off the cliff. And this will block block us just about every time. I, I think in, in a certain way there has to be a, a, a kind of almost lighthearted enthusiasm that we have. Other, you know, morbidity does not help. <laughs> so. Yeah, again, there's a lot. There's a lot there. Um, so a person can have a... A person can discover a connection to that inner self and that's a step forward uh, but then they could they can still be blocked by this feeling of the, I, the identity itself is in some way a block it's th- it's threatened it's that it's that the animal's survival instinct it, it we they start to feel that they're gonna die you know that and it's irrational, but it still gets a hold of us. There has to be some sort of a, oh, a faith or, or sense of direction <clears throat> that things are going to be okay if you can just get yourself out of the way. Now, you can't just say that to somebody and have it happen. It's kind of funny. I think if it follows back along that, uh, commitment thing. If you've made the commitment, then the inner self can figure out how to set things up so that you don't get into the fear to the point where it's blocking you. You know, it, for me, the, the switch of viewpoint 
uh, which is, again, not an experience. It, it's hard to describe, but it happened in a very uh, offhand sort of way. It, it, you know, it, it happened before the emotional center could jump in and panic. And then the, the panicking and the, the freaking out of the emotional center happened later. So, so for some reason it was kept out of the way. And and up until that time, did you uh, did you have that sense of uh, like a fear about what you know what was next or what uh, what enlightenment really meant? Like, was it a scary thing, or had you come to that point of you know I'm 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 there's a little lightheartedness to this. I'm curious, or there, there was both. You know, there there was a the funny thing was that the sense of fear uh, wasn't anything that big of a of a block for me. I've seen it in other people who had have had it to the point where it's, it's knocked them down, but. For me, the sense of fear wasn't that bad because I think I had gotten over it in my days of a uh, of a uh, rock climbing and of doing other things. That it I had been in situations where I was forced right into the very end of things, and so I knew that the irrationality, the fear, would pass. That that had happened to me in uh, being sick before too. So that wasn't that big of a of a of a problem. I I think the the problem uh, mainly was an inability to uh, to to hold a straight line and to have a a quiet mind. It was more like a, a, a discipline thing that that was the main problem that was blocking me. Yeah, you personally. Do you? Um... You know, I, I have heard a couple of people, uh, had conversations with a couple of people that have been at the spiritual search for a long time, and um, and they do seem uh, at a place where they they might phrase it as, you know, I just can't, I, I, I can't seem to let go. Like, I feel like there's this void or this cliff and there's just something that's preventing me from stepping off of it um did did you have any thoughts about a person like that is there something that they could do or try or is it just a matter of just standing at the edge of the cliff until something happens (laughs) So, well, I think both. I think you, you gotta you gotta put yourself there, and and and, and realize that you know it's it, it's a funny paradox. I mean, it, you can't do it from an ego trick or ego will, but at the same time, uh, you know, it, it's got to be done. So, you know, how, how do you get into that position? I th- I think the best way is to go is to kind of back up a step. And try to find out what what might be blocking this. Because in, in my my opinion, or the way I see it, is that this is a natural process. There's nothing uh, uh, weird or alien about it. So if if it's not happening, then what's blocking it? So how do you get back and find out what's causing the uh, emotional block? Usually, it's something that you're hanging on to, you know, you've got dreams that you think, oh my God, if I, if this happens, you know, I, I won't get to live the life that I want to live. And you've got to face that. Or, or what if I think, you know, if it's a moral problem, what if, what if I'm not worthy or I can't do this right or I'll screw it up? You know, it could be lots of things like that. I, I think it has to be as much a, uh, facing oneself and getting to know oneself in an objective uh, discerning manner rather than judging that will help one to move forward or, or to get rid of that. And then the, the process could, could uh, regenerate itself. As I said, I, I see some people who haven't gotten 
well, to, to put it bluntly, they haven't matured. They're, they're still you know, little kids running around in adult bodies and it, completely fixated on spiritual work. And they have to become somehow a, a responsible adult first. And then the process can, can start over again. I did, I did want to talk about dreams for for a moment or two i he, i always enjoy our conversations about dreams and dream work and and i still uh you know that experience i had with you of of being in the uh i don't remember if it was the library in in granby in your in your hometown where you laid out all these drawings that you had done from from different dreams and yeah and we filmed that that was still really stands out in my mind um is is dream work a way of processing uh, you know emotional material or a way of draining off energy blocks oh it, it, it's a great way and what i it, it's a certain method that uh is good for a certain type you know, it's it's good for people that are, uh, let's say, uh, I don't like using the word, but let's say sensitive in a social sense, so that they have a hard time with, say, uh, group work or confrontation, because uh, it just brings up defenses. They either get offended or they go blank if they try to uh, talk with other people about themselves. So they have a hard time seeing their blind spots <clears throat> in a sort of normal way. They might not be able to pick it up on social situations or work, which can be a gold mine of seeing what these things are. So the, the dream work is a way that you can do that sort of by and sidestep the, uh, the defense mechanisms. In other words, it's not as threatening. If the dreams will show you something about yourself and then you can work on that, you, you don't have the... Uh, those emotional defenses that say, oh my God, we can't look at this, it's too painful. You can look at it and, and have the realizations of, oh my God, look at look at this thing about myself that I couldn't see, but the dream put it right up in front of me. And it's clear, and it can release something that way. Then you might can go back out into social situations and be... Uh, more ready for it. You'll you'll see what's coming. You realize why you've been doing what you've been doing. It, it just makes it a a lot less violent, so to speak. You know, I'm always amazed at at, the, at how the dreams can help you in certain ways, but they require some work because dreams talk in a very old, strange language. They they talk in an archetypal language of like metaphors, and it's very personalized so it, it takes some work to figure out what the dreams are saying and also one one big block can be is to find that a lot of times dreams are taking your inner contents as a whole world so that when you have a dream it's all about what's going on inside you no matter who the characters are so it, it's a lot of times not about the people you're dreaming about. It's about what part of you is uh, related to that person so that you use their image for your particular facet. So yeah, I think dreams are, are a great way to, uh, to get to know ourselves so that we can become uh, more objective, more discerning rather than uh, judgmental and reactive. Yeah, that that just reminded me of a comment. Um, someone saying that in the external world, uh, the the everyday external world, every com every external conflict that we have is simply a reflection of an internal conflict <laughs> that we have, and that again, you know the 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 parent or the spouse or the friend or co-worker that those are all symbolic of something similar going on inside of us with parts of ourselves yeah it, it, that's exactly it i had a friend who uh 
was giving me dreams for a while, and it, it took him a bit, but uh, when it finally clicked, he was just like, oh my gosh, this knocks the ball out of the park. I, I, I see what you've been trying to say, that this is a facets of my own personality and how it gets along with the other facets and, and what the inner drama is and what the inner hierarchies are. And to, to see that rather than always putting it outside, it, it's like a switching from thinking that everything is somebody else's fault or is the world's fault and finally seeing that, you know, most of it is what we do to ourselves. It, it's, it's a big, big switch. Mm-hmm. And the, and the whole, I mean, this whole topic of the repressed emotional material, it came up in the, in this conversation, the context of how do I get to the point where I can actually practice the listening attention? Yes. And it, that, that's, that's it. And that is, um, I mean, are, are there people who, uh, what am I trying to say? If you look at uh, mindfulness meditation, for example, you know, mindfulness meditation uh, would not say uh, that, you know, if, a, if this pattern came up of, uh, you know, every time I sit down, I try to meditate, I start thinking about my father, um, a mindfulness technique would say, simply note a oh, thought about my father, thought about my father, thought about my father, every, you know, that noting practice. Uh, yeah. He, he, I don't know if you have experience with that approach or maybe have worked with people who are involved in that. Does, does that work? work I mean eventually if I just do enough <laughs> noting and I just see the same thing 10,000 times as I'm sitting down trying to meditate can that can that work or is is that just you're just going to be stuck I you know I think it depends on a person's type and uh, how far along they are on the path I think if they were somewhat or mostly clear emotionally when they started on it, I think it, it, it might could be a good good process. But otherwise, I think it would just take forever. I don't think we've got that many years. You know, I think we've got to get at it a little, uh, a little more energetically and a little more bravely. I think we've got to face up to the fact that we really don't know ourselves and what's going on with us. And that being clear is not simply a uh, decision. It's, it, it's got to be something that has to actually uh, happen. Like a, if you're going to cook a meal, you've actually got to use heat and cook and things have to change. It, it's not going to happen just because you stare at the food. You know, there's got to be some, a process. I, so I think people get hung up and in wishful thinking, magical thinking. And they think that by simply agreeing with something that it's going to become real. I think this goes back around to the having a practical ego. If you know what it takes to accomplish a long, hard task, which is basically becoming, then you'll know that there has to be the same thing sort of has to happen to you. We have to up our probabilities. It's much more probable that we'll find out who we are if we're not stuck in, in an immature uh, human state. You know, the, the more work we can do on ourselves, I think the, the uh, closer we can get to having some success. Of course, this, it too has to be watched out from taking it too far people can get stuck in uh analyzing their emotions forever you know it's they can find a safe place to hide there what's your opinion or impression of some some teachings and non-duality uh where they guide people through a process and the and the eventual 
realization, a result of that process is, uh, and oh, I, there's actually everything that's happening is appearing on a screen, and that screen is awareness. Is that what? What? How, what do you consider that? Is that achieving a connection to the inner self? Is that you know, or is that something? Is that just a quiet mind? What's your thought on that? Yeah, I, I think that's kind of the the same thing. I think it's a, a that we were talking about. It's that it's a well for me. It's a mental thing. What what they're doing is they're observing a certain mental part of themselves and how it works, but they're not getting involved. And that's a good thing, but the problem is, is, is what happens when they're not doing that? Do, are they just getting up and going on about their day-to-day -day business with their same problems, making a mess out of stuff perhaps, but whenever the, the thought occurs to them, then they jump back to looking at the screen again. I mean, is, is this an actual change in their being? Or is this simply a mental trick in order to uh, hide from your emotions? You know, I don't see that uh, these, these things work for 99.9% .9 of the people. There could be people out there who that's all they need. It's just that little bit of information and then it clicks for them. But for most people, I think it's an escape. I, I think they're, they're just, they're playing the game of stay away. They're trying to stay away from themselves, and whatever works, works. But I think we have to become clear, and we don't become clear by having the ego make the decision we're clear, or by watching the inside of our head. I mean, that that's a useful thing, but for me, it's a zero point. It's not, it's a starting point. It's not the finish. Yeah, that's an interesting way to phrase it, is a, is a zero point, uh, not meaning a negative, but I think you mean like a baseline. Yeah, it's like uh, sitting on the, uh, right in between the opposites. You haven't moved yet. You still don't know what you are, but you found a, uh, a foundation where you're not being bothered, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm just curious. I was I was thumbing through your book, The Listening Attention, uh, which came out in 2010. Um, I mean, have you have you thought about <laughs> writing like a follow up to it uh, based on the the you know what things that you've noticed in the in the 10 years since then or do you do you still feel like you know that book is that's pretty solid and it and I said what I needed to say about the topic you, you know the way I see that is is most of the time I forget about it I, I don't even remember that it's around until somebody will write me or and say you know I read your book and you know I really like this and what did you mean by this and I'll have to go Oh my God, I forgot about that. It, it, to me, it's, it's kind of like a, that was a thing of the time. It was something I wrote at the time. And then once it was out, it, uh, it kind of just disappeared. I, you know, I would like to write a follow-up to it in, in terms of what has happened in the past 10 years or so. But it, it just hasn't popped up yet. I, you know, I... I forget about uh, that idea. It just is not pressing anymore. It seems like things are more along the lines of, of uh, doing things personally with people rather than sitting down and writing anymore. The writing bug seems to have uh, sort of gone on vacation. Yeah, and that, that, you know, that's actually a good segue. I did, I did want to talk some about uh, you've got a big change uh, which we've talked about uh, offline uh, coming up in your life in terms of moving from Colorado. Um, and uh, you're going to be the, the 
for lack of a better word, the teacher in residence at the Tap Foundation's new center in North Carolina. And I, I, yeah, I don't want to talk uh, just a little bit about what you, I don't, you know, I don't know your, your dreams for that or hopes for that or like what you personally are excited about uh, with this new chapter. Yeah. I, you know, that that's a good, good thing to talk about. I, I'm really looking forward to it. It's something that was been percolating in the back of my mind for oh, three or four years, but I haven't been able to, you know, find a way out or for it to manifest but I'd love to get involved there and to get into more social situations and situations where people uh, have the opportunity to actually uh, you know work with me and talk to people you know to be able to have a center where there's the opportunities for people to come and spend quiet time without being uh, preached to, without having routines and dogma, and also but to have somebody there that they can ask questions of and get direction from. And I'm looking forward to it in a lot of ways. I used to go to the Smokies when I was a kid, and that area had relatives there, so it's it's very nostalgic uh, oh, environment around there. And to have an actual house like this for Tad. It's been a long time. And this this place is sort of new. It's it's sort of like it's free and clear. So that we can we can do what we want in the place. So I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to getting in to talking to people, especially the younger people, and finding out, you know, what are they thinking about with spiritual work? How do they how are they trying to go about it? How, how can they uh, relate to people who've been down the path and can it help them on their path? Yeah, that's always, uh, and I think because I got introduced to Richard Rose and the, the very concept of a, a spiritual search and enlightenment, awakening, uh, when I was in college, uh, and, you know, I'm obviously many years past my college prime now. <laughs> I, I, I'm very curious since uh, you're, you know, you're only going to be a half hour or so from University of Chapel Hill, for example. Like what, you know, what are college students interested in? I, I, I don't know anything about the demographics of the people who listen to this podcast, for example. Like is there a single college age person who even listens to this podcast i have no idea yeah it, it's funny i've i've got a guy uh who a good friend who's uh lives in colorado that we get together every once in a while to talk about this stuff and he's that age so it's very interesting to talk to him because there's a very different mindset from the people my age but it's very, very similar to what I remember when I was his age. You know, the words are all different, but the the, the feeling is the same. So that's going to be interesting. It's going to be like a, a time machine in a way, you know, to be going back uh, to to the college times, but with, uh, oh, I don't know, I guess you'd say a less naivete. Yeah. And and you've you've mentioned uh, group work or working with groups of people several times in this several times in this conversation, and I, you know, I think some people are familiar with that. Yet other people see the spiritual search as a, just a solitary thing that, you know, there's nobody in my hometown who's interested in this kind of stuff, or even why why would I even meet with other people because spiritual work is about sitting and meditating you know what what uh what do you see as the the value of group work or what is what does group work look like to you to me it's it's half of it i think the other half is the solitary point right now i seem to be talking about the group work because it's what i'm looking forward to i guess but I think it's the opposite, and you need them both. 
in order to be able to see yourself. If you spend too much time alone, you can tend to wander off in imagination and you don't have the strength to overcome resistances in yourself. And you can uh, say too, uh, too easily offended or too easily hypnotized. So for me, group work is, is a way to build up your, your strength and at the same time to come to know other people as yourself. And it's also the big, uh, the big mirror. You know, if you're in, in a group and you have strange ideas about yourself that you're not aware of, if you try to get into doing group work, those things could be pointed out to you rather quickly so that you have an outside reflection of yourself, of who you are, which is very handy. You know, you can take that. And it also helps you to see what did I understand in my solitary meditations and is it real and will it stand up to society or am I just going to throw it away the next time I get around people you know both of these things you know help uh, change our being I think they're, they're both very necessary group work is uh, for me has always been by far the hardest part because my inclination was always just to wander off into the woods and heck with it. So it, it's very fascinating to me because of the, uh, the potential. You know, otherwise I find that if uh, I wasn't involved in group work, I'd probably just wander off and camping in Montana, living off coffee and french fries and never see anybody <laughs> again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and you mentioned uh, you mentioned the word confrontation. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Richard Rose's idea of group confrontation, what what is what is that? Because it sounds like something bad. Yeah, <laughs> you know, for the first uh, couple of years I was involved in it, I thought it was something bad too. <laughs> it would. It was such a surprise, too, because I would go into it thinking, oh, I'm hot stuff and I know what's going to happen and I'm going to get in here and talk about this and that. And as soon as I'd get on the hot seat, I would just lock up. I would go into a blank stare and that would be the end of it. And it took a long time to get past that. But it was quite a shock. It just shows you how little we might know about what we're really like. You know, what, what we think we're like in our heads when we're alone and then put you on the hot seat in a group of people <clears throat> talking and you see a different side. But the, the confrontation thing, I, it, it, that word doesn't help in a way either, but it's, uh, to me, it's, it's a way of getting a viewpoint of your belief system that's outside yourself that gives you another way of looking at things. You know, you, we get so stuck in our own head with the thoughts going around and around and around and the same old feelings, and we don't question them. And if you calmly sit down with a group of other people and then talk about yourself and look, watch them and see how they react, oh my gosh, you know, you, you get to see, you know, truly how much we get lost in our fantasies and our little daydreams about ourselves. And this can shock us out. Plus, we get to look at other people and see they're doing the same thing. And so, how can we help each other to, to become more objective to ourselves? And it, it can work really well because there's also a certain uh, energy that forms in the room if everybody's headed in the same direction. And, and that can make for sort of a positive energetic safe place and that the the truth can come to light in a way that uh isn't isn't too threatening it, it can just be magical it, it can also turn into a uh, a drama if it goes the wrong way but you know it's definitely something worth trying i was thinking uh, uh some of my own experiences that I might even say that I got as much value from asking questions of people as from having questions asked of me, as long as my attitude in the asking was 
inspired or coming from some place other than trying to prove a point or you know, trying to show how smart I am or that I've already figured out what their you know what their angle is or how their mind works or whatever belief I might have had but you know asking from a more self selfless place perhaps yeah I, I think that's very very handy and I think it's necessary you know when I first started reading uh oh dialogues of Ramana Maharshi and even in uh Carlos Castaneda's dialogues between him and Don Juan in these books I used to get irritated that how come the people talking to Ramana Maharshi and how come Castaneda were so stupid and asking such stupid questions but then I didn't realize that if they didn't, you wouldn't get the answers. So if we ask the questions of people, and no matter how you know stupid we might think they are, how spontaneous or how you know off the wall or irrelevant they might seem, then we get an answer. There's got to be a dialogue. It can't all be one-sided. So if you ask somebody something too, then it, it can clear it up for yourself. Like you're saying, it, it's just like, oh my God, you know, that's something I needed to hear and I couldn't get through it until I, you know, put it out there. Mm-hmm. Slightly different, completely different topic. Uh, I did want to ask you about, uh, you, you wrote another book, uh, Dark Zen. Uh, which is actually uh, a work of fiction, and I was just—I just, just want to ask, I guess, two things. One, what what did you see as the value in writing a, a work of fiction, and what has been, uh, like, what's been the response to that work? You know, it was mainly I wrote it for fun. I, I think is the big thing. I was into writing. And it just occurred to me that it would be just a riot to write this book. It was about, it's, it's basically autobiographical. I mean, I've got some friends here who have read it, and they just go, Bob, that's you. That was you. You know, and so it, it was uh, writing out things that had happened to me so that I could go back through them in a way. I know there was a, a fellow who wrote that uh, book, A River Runs Through It. Yeah, he, he said that he wrote the book so that he could understand his life, so that what had happened to him. And I thought that's a good way of explaining it. You know, it just kind of put together things that had happened to me in a way that I could get them out on paper and look at them. It, it is sort of like people say, I wrote my book so that I could read it. You know, I, I just wanted to see what does all this look like if I write it all out. Now, that was why I did it for myself. It was, you know, it was fun to do, and it, and I just, it just made me uh, smile. I was riding it. It was fun. And the, the re what I'd like to think that people could get out of it was there were a lot of things that had happened to me that I wanted to write them down before I forgot about them. I thought, you know, get them written down so they're somewhere so they just don't fade off. And maybe somebody will read it and they'll go, oh, I, I, that's happened to me and I now I understand what's going on. It, and, it, and that might help. So that was that. And the response to it has been, a, it, it, every, most people like it, but I can tell that it's in a different category from the listening attention. You know, the listening attention is the one that people go, Oh, wow, I got something from that. Dark Zen is more like, that's the book that they read it because they know me and they and they enjoy it. That reminds me, I was talking to someone last night, actually, who said uh, what, they, what they actually liked most when they were reading a book was not reading it and going, oh, yeah, I've had that happen to me, but reading it and going... I have never had something like that happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so, uh, I like that. Yeah, it, 
that, that could be part of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Do you have any, uh, do you have any recommendations for, uh, for books that, uh, you know, you, you, you know, routinely say to people, you know, you should, you should pick up this book, read this book. Yeah, you know, there, there's some that I, I go back to a lot of times because I, I like the way the person put things, you know, I, the way they could talk about it is real interesting to me. You know, the I think the most favorite thing I've ever written really isn't a book. I mean, that I've read is, uh, and that's Maurice Nicole's commentaries. You know, he wrote this five-volume commentary uh, which is actually just a collection of his weekly talks to his group in England. And somebody recorded the things and stuck them all together in a book, or in, in several books. And, and to me, he, it's so good because it's very personal. It, it's like he's talking to a little group, and he's saying, look, this is what you guys need to do. And it comes off very directly. It, it shows the the, uh, the the way we need to think about this work in a uh, practical and serious manner rather than forgetting about it when we're not in a meeting. And I've always gotten a lot from that book. You know, another book's on a completely different angle. I am was very uh, emotionally based and had, from my, in my childhood especially, and the books that really ring a bell for me are Roy Masters' books. He wrote a little one called, uh, his main one called "The Mind: How the Mind Can Keep You Well. And to me, it, it explains very explicitly how emotional traumas get a sidetracked. I wouldn't say it's a book about enlightenment as much as a book about how do you free yourself from your emotional knots. That yeah, that's huge. I've never read that. Every uh, year that goes by, if I take another look at it, I'm just amazed at it. That how he wrote it. He it's one of those books that every time I read it, it it's a completely different book. Mm-hmm. You know, I see a whole another side to it, and it it's very uh, hard for some people to read because it's very direct and they find it offensive. Because he he's old fashioned. He's like Rose was and it, from a different era, you know. And, but it, the emotional uh, functioning of, uh, of ourselves is still the same. And he, he shows how we get stuck in that and shows a pretty good system how to get out. His form of meditation, I think, is very similar to TM, but he puts a, a little bit of a different spin on it. Mm-hmm. And I and I assume he's not. Uh, he passed away some years ago. No, oh. he's still he's still okay. alive, but he's very he's out of he's out of the picture. He's he's in his nineties, and uh, he he doesn't do any work anymore. He's past the point of being able to communicate very well. His sons are have taken up the uh, the organization. Okay, and and then I, I always like to ask people. Um, if there's any films or TV series that they that they like along the you know that touch upon spiritual themes and and uh, if not uh, that's fine but I always like to ask. Yeah, you know, you, I, I can I can't think of anything right off the bat, but yeah, you can get a lot from from uh, certain movies and things, especially from watching them. I, I found that the funniest thing that happened to me watching movies was that I found that it was sort of like group meditation in a way. If I could watch a movie and not respond personally and emotionally to it, that that was an incredible step. <laughs> it's kind of like life. If you can sit through a movie and not have the movie get you all upset, that you gain a certain objectivity from it. So just as kind of a strange meditation process hmm. that that is really interesting i never i had never thought about that yeah it's just a way of uh if you can't be out you know talking to people all the time trying to uh, see what happens to you and observe your reactions 
in social situations, you know, watch movies and see and see the same thing. Because you know, your body will respond to the movie as if the movie's real. So you've got a gold mine there if you want to look at it. That is really uh, personally very fascinating to me, Bob. And I think that <laughs> I think actually that points to uh, like some of the differences between your emotional makeup and mine. In that, I I would go to movies. Uh, back in the day, in order to experience some emotion, <laughs> because I, I was so disconnected from my emotional life that I needed help. Uh, that that's funny because that was the other way around. I was so so wired up with this emotional stuff driving me up the wall that I had to find some way to get free of it. <laughs> that's funny, you know. The end, the endless differences and variations among people is, yeah, why, you know, why you can't just have a cookie cutter book that says here are the ten steps to enlightenment. Exactly, it, it, you, we all have to get back to where we started from where we are, and it, it that makes it very personal. I think that's one of the great. Uh, advantages and opportunities that, that TAT presents and that the TAT Center will be able to present is there are a varied collection of teachers from almost every angle. So if, if there's something that's not clicking with you, there's somebody there, there probably is. So I, I think that's going to be a great opportunity for people. Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of, a lot of different personal experiences and uh, emotional makeups among the different teachers in TAT. Well, we're, uh, we're coming up on the half hour mark. Is there, uh, I don't know, are there any final thoughts that, uh, that you wanted to pass on to people? The only thing I can say is don't, uh, don't take this too lightly and let yourself off the hook. You know, this, this is, the spiritual work it, it is important. It, it's important and it's worth uh, giving time and energy to. It, it's it's a worthwhile direction, and it's also something that doesn't require you to move off into a cave or go to Tibet or to you know to change your uh, life in any drastic manner. It, it will make your life better, even if you don't make the trip. It will, things can improve. So, you know, find ways to keep yourself inspired. You know, keep, keep moving. Find your brothers. You know, that's very important. You know, your real family is out there if you can find them. And your real life is inside you. We all have a potential. I've thought a lot that uh, DNA is actually programming us and that we never even get started with the potential that is inside of us that, that that could let loose if we can you know just somehow get around to the point of uh, allowing it get clear enough to let our lives come forth you know life is something very different from thought it, it's not an ide an ideology it, it's something real and this this work and the, the work that the people in tat do and spiritual work in general can connect you with something real. You know, it, it, it's infinitely better than wandering around in uh, unknown uh, emotions and thought patterns. So, so stick with it. Thank you for that, Bob. Oh, you're welcome. It's really nice talking today. I, I'm getting a kick out of it. Yeah, thanks for your time today. Uh, it's been a, it's been a pleasure and I will, uh, You've got a couple websites out there, which I will link to in the show notes, and uh, and then people can uh, people can get in touch with you through those websites if they'd like more info. Yeah, they, yeah, they can, and also, uh, you know, we I'll be there in North Carolina in about a month. Wow! Yeah, <laughs> that's coming up fast. Yeah, it is. It is. All right. Thanks, Bob. You take care. You too, Sean. Thanks. 
Thank you for listening to this edition of Journals of Spiritual Discovery. I'm your host, Sean Nevins. For more information about today's guest, as well as more interviews, books, and other resources, go to spiritualteachers.org. That's spiritualteachers.org.